All right, let's get started. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another exciting morning of chemistry, Chem 1211, with your host, me, Dr. White. Let me straighten my glasses there, now I can see. And we're going to have a wild morning. It's going to be explosive. Count on it. All right, what I'd like to do today is, first of all, go through the problem set for chapter nine, and then we'll do the lab. And then I have set up where I'd like you to go to breakout rooms, meet your colleagues, and I'll stop by and I get to meet you. Hold on a second, my glasses are dirty. I apologize. Oh, by the way, a uh, real good glass cleaner. Get the microfiber towels from Walmart. They work real good, assuming you have coated lenses, which I do. All right, let's do that and let's get started. Took me a second because. All right, first of all, let me make this a little larger. Everybody see chapter nine on your screen? Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, let's go through this. Now this, you're asked to write the electron configuration for various elements. And in order to do that, you have to know how many electrons. But before we do that, let me remind you something that will be on important and important information. So you don't have to memorize this, but you have to know how to use this. When we talk about electron configuration, We're talking about all the electrons. And you have to know about shells and subshells in this case number of subshells. I used to make students memorize this, but as I told you about almost two years now, I decided less memorization, just show me you know how to use this. And the shells are one, two, three, and four. And the number of subshells in one is one, in two is two, three is three, four is four. And This is the lowest energy, and this is the highest energy shell. And another thing you should know is the subshells I'm almost done.
and the subshells are S, P, D, and F. And S, you can put a maximum of two electrons, P, six, D, 10, F, 14. Now, remember my gift, you only have to know up the magnesium. So for my class, you only have to know the S and P subshells. Shh, don't tell anybody about my gift, Shh. okay? And when you're filling shells and subshells, you start with the lowest energy first, which means you'd fill one, two, then three and four. And each shell, the subshells, you always start with S, then P. Remember a subshell of a shell is both a number and a letter. A subshell of a shell is both the number and the letter. And now let's go do a couple. Now, nitrogen, how many electrons? Well, you know, look up the atomic number and seven. The lowest shell is one, lowest energy, and the only has one subshell, which is one S. And you can put two electrons in there. Next, you can take now you filled up one because it only has one subshell. You have to go to shell two and the lowest subshell in shell two is 2s. And 2s can only take two electrons. Well, I filled it up. Shell two, you can put have two subshells. The first one is 2s. The second one is 2p. In any P orbital, we can put a maximum of six electrons, but we only have seven. Two plus two is four, seven minus four, three, we're done. And that's how you do it. And the rest of them are the same way. And with this, why don't you do the electron configuration for magnesium, which has 12 electrons? Your turn. Dr. White's going to share the fun. One of these days, I'm going to bring a tape of game show music, you know, like they have, dun, 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 dun. never mind, I'm not going to ruin your morning singing game show music, it ruined my morning too. And when you're done, give me a thumbs up, or if you have your video on, your webcam on, give me a smile. If you notice, I'm having a good beard day. 
I don't know about my hair, but the beard feel, it's still there. That's a good day. All right, anybody need more time? I guess not, so let's do it. All right, we have 12 electrons. Let me put this up here. And the first shell, we use the lowest energy, which is one, and you put electrons in subshell, and a shell, subshell is both a number and a letter. How many electrons can we put in any S subshell? Two. Well, how many shell subshells does one have? One, and we filled it up. So now we go to the next subshell, next shell, and that's two, and the first subshell is 2s. How many electrons can we put in 2s? Well, any s or uh, subshell, you can put two electrons. Well, I filled that up. I've only got four. I got to go to 12. So notice two has two subshells. The first one is 2s. Remember, subshell number and letter. Second one is 2p. Well, how many electrons can I put in any p orbital? And the answer is six. Well, I'm going to do that because I have six I can put in there. Well, now I have two plus two plus six, 10. Well, I'm trying to get to 12. I have two more left. Notice shell two only has two subshells. And I fill them, 2s and 2p. Well, now I have to go to shell number three. And what's the first subshell? And that's always s. You start from the lowest and you work down. And remember, a subshell is a number and a letter, 3s. I have 10. 12 minus 10 equals 2. How many can I put maximum in any s? Subshell two, well, I can do that. And now I'm done. That's one S2, two S2, two P6, three S2. And that adds up to 12 and we're done. And that's how you do it. If you notice, oh, I made a mistake here. The two fell off on there, oops. And that's how you do it. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is valence electrons. And you should know valence electrons are the outermost electrons of an element. And how do you tell valence electrons? Well, you look at a periodic table. And you look at the numbers on top. The number in the box, like for lithium-3, tells you how many total electrons, but the number at the top, either Roman numeral or the regular numeric numeral I wrote in, tells you how many valence electrons. And I would ask you to do the following. How many valence electrons does nitrogen have? Your turn. I'll give you 2.8 seconds. Hurry up. Dum, da -dum, da -dum. I gave you more. And the answer is nitrogen, chemical symbol here. And look at top five. If I ask sulfur, how many valence electrons does sulfur have? Your turn. And time's up. Sulfur, chemical symbol S. Look on top, six. And if I ask iodine, how many valence electrons does iodine have? Your turn. And the answer is iodine is right here. Look on top and it's seven. Oh, let's do one more. Let's do, ooh, for strong bones, let's look at calcium. And how many valence electrons does calcium have?
And the answer is here, calcium Ca, two valence electrons. And that's how you do that. If you notice, I have a whole bunch here, right here. All right, let's move on to the next practice problem. I just noticed I don't have it, so let's do it right here on the whiteboard. Oh, good news. If you noticed the last couple of days, I was having computer problems. And um, my computer that I'm running on right now, I actually have three in my office. But this one was giving me difficulties. I finally just, oh my gosh, I forgot. I forgot. It's got a monster fans for the chip and the motherboard. And I've got to clean out the dirt from those. And I did that. And that means it's better cooling. And it's not working fine. Watch. <laughs> no. All right. Oh, by the way, if I had something like give the electron configuration for like magnesium, that would be three points on a test. Oops, I gave that away. All right, next, let's practice doing draw the Lewis structure for. And Lewis structure for elements are using the, elect uh, the valence electrons. You put one dot on one side before doubling up. Now, I just remembered somebody brought up a good point and I should have mentioned it in class, but I'll mention it now. I'll mention it again tomorrow. I'll, I've taught you two different types of Lewis structures. One is for elements and the other is for molecules. For elements, you put one dot on each side before you double up and you never have more than two dots on a side. However, for compounds or molecules, that rule doesn't apply. Let me say that again. When you're doing Lewis structures, when you do elements, you put one dot on a side before you double up and you never have more than two valence electrons dots on one side. For molecules, that rule doesn't apply. And for the colleague who brought that up, thank you. So let's look at this. If I ask you to draw the Lewis structure for carbon, the first thing you have to find out is carbon has four valence electrons from the periodic table. And now I put a dot on each side and I'm done. Now we just did sulfur and sulfur has six valence electrons. And I'll let you try it on your own. All right, anybody need more time? 
going once, twice. All right, let's do it. So sulfur, how do you draw the Lewis structure? You put the symbol, you look for the number of valence electrons on top of the column, and you put one on each side, and you start doubling up. Now, organic chemists like to do this similar to oxygen, but you could have also done something like this. And all you have are two sides with two dots and two sides with one dot. And there are other ways you could draw it. I'm going to let you try one more. And before I do that, I'm going to make you look up the valence electrons. I'm going to be real mean today. And iodine is what you're trying to draw. Let's go to our periodic table. And first of all, find how many valence electrons iodine has, and then draw the Lewis structure. All right, anybody need more time? Well, nobody's screaming at me, which is a good thing. So let's do it. First of all, iodine, how many valence electrons? Look at the top. VII or the number seven tells you seven valence electrons. Therefore, we write the chemical symbol First of all, I'll write this so you and I can remember how many valence electrons. And we put a dot on one side. And now we start doubling up. And this is one way of drawing it. Another way would be this. And there are two more ways. Three sides have two dots and one side has one dot. And that's how you do Lewis structure. Now, once you get to doing Lewis structures, then let's talk about covalent bonds. And here we have draw the Lewis structure for the following molecules. How do you do that? You need to know the valence electrons and you need to know also the following on the next page that there are three types of covalent bonds and you should know how many pairs of electrons. And oh, guess what time it is? It's class participation time. You don't have to turn your microphone on, but everybody together with Dr. White, what's the first type of covalent bond? Single bond. Single. Thank you. Second one, double, double. bond. And double. The, yep. And the third, oh, I got an echo here. And the third one, triple, triple. triple bond. And we're out of phase, but you got it. Remember, single bond, double bond, triple bond. And you should know that a single bond has one pair of electrons, double bond, two pair of electrons, triple bond, triple bond, three pair of electrons. I'll say that again. Single bond, one pair of electrons, double bond, two pairs, triple bond, three pairs. So if we look up here, water, 
how do you do the valence electrons? Well, water has, and let me go to my whiteboard, two hydrogens. and one oxygen. Each hydrogen has one valence electron and the oxygen has six valence electrons. Remember the octet. All elements want to gain, share, or lose electrons to have an octet, eight valence electrons. The one exception is hydrogen. Its octet is two. So if I have this oxygen and this hydrogen says, I've got one valence electron, you've got one, let's share. And they form a single bond. And the other hydrogen says the same thing. And now we have water. And that's how you do it. Oh, let me have you try one. How many of you have ever been to a campground and you pump some water out in the ground and you go, oh, it smells like rotten eggs or hard boiled eggs, which I like, my sister hates because of the smell. To this day, she doesn't even like making them even when she asks you for certain recipes. And what you're smelling is H2S, hydrogen sulfide. By the way, sulfur compounds stink. Another example of a stinky sulfur compound in organic chemistry are the compounds skunks use as their defensive weapon. If you've ever been by where an animal has been skunked or just a skunk let loose, you know, that stinks. And that's a sulfur compound. Now, why don't you draw the Lewis structure for hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen has one valence electron. Sulfur has six valence electrons. And your turn. Hint, sulfur has to be in the middle. And when you're done, give me a thumbs up. Someone has nice lighting. All right, I think everybody's done. Let's do this. All right, sulfur has six valence electrons. And a hydrogen has one. So it says, I've got one, you've got one unpaired sulfur, let's share. And I put an extra one in here, I got ahead of myself. Hydrogen has this one, sulfur has a lone one. It says, let's share. And that's how you have hydrogen sulfide. All right, let's look at another molecule. Let's look at carbon uh, tetrachloride. And here, same thing. You have a nitrogen and three chlorines. So let's look how you do that. Now, each nitrogen has five valence electrons. Each chlorine has seven valence electrons. If I put the nitrogen in the middle, and it's the only way you can work, here's the Lewis structure. If we look at the Lewis structure for chlorine, 
chlorine has one single electron. Oh, over here, nitrogen has one. So this chlorine says to nitrogen, hey, let's share. And they do. Don't forget the non-bonding electrons are still there. And then another chlorine says, oh, you've got one. I've got one. Let's share. And finally, the last chlorine does the same thing. And that's how you do it. And let's have you try one. Dr. White? Yes. Are you always looking for um are you always looking for the one uh that has a missing? Well, you're trying to get an octet. So here each right now you have around nitrogen five, and it needs three more to get to eight octet. And chlorine has seven and needs one more to get to eight. And therefore, that's why you have three chlorines, each one shares. Does that answer your question? Okay, I see. So they all, they need eight to complete. Right. And what I should have done, and I'll do now, is if we look at this chlorine, how many electrons shared and non-bonding does it have? And you count the dots and say it's got a octet. Now, if we look at the other chlorines would be the same. If we look at nitrogen, how many electrons non-bonding and shared does it have? If you look in the blue box, you'll see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And it has eight valence electrons, so its octet is full. Now the exception is hydrogen. If we look at hydrogen here, how many valence electrons does it have? Two. And its octet for hydrogen is actually two. Now, if we look at sulfur, that same molecule, how many does it have? Eight. And that's the driving force. Does that help better? Yes, that works. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you for your question. All questions are good questions. So it's your turn. And nitrogen, five valence electrons, hydrogen, one valence electron. And draw the Lewis structure for ammonia, NH3. And anybody need more time? Oh, it looks like everybody's saying, no, get the work, Dr. White. So I will. All right, we have nitrogen. It has five valence electrons. Hydrogen has one. This hydrogen says, oh, I've got one valence electron. You've got one here, nitrogen. Let's share. And they do. And the other hydrogen does it too. And the third hydrogen does it. And that's how you do ammonia. Now, ooh, I got a good question. In the ammonia you just drew, or I just did, put a box around the non-bonding electrons and put a circle around the bonded electrons. I'll say that again. For the ammonia you just drew, put a box around the non-bonding electrons, put it a circle or really on the ellipse to be specific 
around the bonded electrons. Doesn't it feel good, all the stuff you're learning and able to do now? All right. Uh, Dr. Wright? Yes. Can I see number four on the practice sheet done? I'll, let me finish that. And the answer is yes, of course. Oh, that reminds me of a story. Uh, before we do number four, I'll do a story. First of all, let me do what I asked you to do. All right, let's put a box around the non-bonding electrons and a circle around the bonded. So ammonia has three single bonds. And let me tell a quick little story and then I'll do number four. If I forget, remind me. Uh, as I mentioned, I worked for two Anglo-Dutch companies, really more Dutch than English. Uh, one was AXO, at that time was called AXO Chemie. The other was uh, Unichema Chemicals, which was part of Unilever, which meant I went to the Netherlands a lot. Great country, if you haven't been there, go. I haven't been there in decades because I've now I've worked for American companies that I didn't go over to Europe like I used to. But the first or second time, I think it was uh, the second time or third time I was in Europe or in Netherlands, and I was staying in The Hague, which is really pronounced Den Haag if you're Dutch. And I wanted, had the weekend off and I Saturday figure, I can get on train, go to Amsterdam. If you've never been to Amsterdam, you should. So coming back, if you've ever been on Dutch trains, you got to switch trains at certain stops to get to the town you're trying to go to. So I wasn't unsure of myself. Am I doing the right thing? Even though the board said so. Sometimes they split a train, half of it goes one way, half of it goes the other. And that was the case. And there was this conductor, classic Dutch with the goatee, about my height, and classic, this is classic Dutch mentality. I walked up to him and said, sir, could you, is this train go to the Hague? Or I, I pronounced it correctly, Den Haag. And he looks at me and says, of course it does. And that's classic Dutch. And I just said, of course I will. And I realized I was slipping into classic Dutch. By the way, being in a senior management meeting in the Netherlands was always exciting because the way people would attack, not the person, but their idea was quite Dutch and quite, how should I say, direct, which you could never do in the United States because American managers would get bent out of shape. Dutch didn't because, hey, they expect it. All right, let me do number four. Was it number four or was it, we're still in two? Whoever asked the question, are you asking for me to do this one right here? No, from the, from number one. Oh. I mean, sorry, for number two, sorry, for number two, yeah, for number two. Which one, so number two? Or it would be letter. Sodium hydroxide E? Yeah. All right, I was going to do that next. So the answer is yes, because I was looking for number four. There is no number four. Are you trying to mess with my brain? Did a good job. All right, let's do this. Question is, do the Lewis structure for an AOH is called sodium hydroxide. It's also called, how many of you have ever heard the term lye, like in lye soap? and that's using sodium hydroxide to make it. All right, let's do it. Now, if we look at sodium hydroxide, 
sodium, one valence electron, oxygen, six valence electron, and hydrogen, one valence electron. And you know you can get that from the periodic table. Now, let's look at the periodic table because this is very important. If you look at the first two columns, the alkali metal, not hydrogen, but the alkali metal and the alkaline earth metals, they never form covalent bonds. I'll say it again. The alkali metals, this column right here, and the alkaline earth metals, like magnesium and calcium, never form covalent bonds. Now, what do they do? Well, they give up electrons and form cations. And I think we went through, and if not, I'll do it next lab, if I forgot to do it, or maybe Monday in class, we went through what cation will an element form. And the cation, sodium forms, it loses its one outer electron and forms that, a positive cation, or cation is a plus one cation. Now oxygen has its six valence electrons. Hydrogen has one and says to oxygen, hey, let's share. But, oh no, look here. Oxygen doesn't have its octet. It's only got seven valence electrons. What do we do? Relax. Where did the electron right here that sodium had to make the cation go to? It goes to the oxygen, and this forms the hydroxide anion, and now that's the Lewis structure between sodium and the hydroxide is an ionic bond. And between oxygen and hydrogen and hydroxide OH is a covalent bond. Okay, and that's how you do it. Oh, let's try another one of these. Uh, first, um, oh, let's do this. And why don't you try potassium hydroxide which has the very old name of potash because it was found originally in the ashes under the pot you used to cook with when you had a fireplace. And the question is, draw the Lewis structure for potassium hydroxide KOA. All right, is everybody done? I think so, so let's do this. If we look at this molecule, oh, I have a potassium and that's an alkali metal. And as I taught you, that forms a plus one cation, but oxygen has six valence electrons. Hydrogen has one and says to oxygen, let's share. 
And now again, we have seven valence electrons and oxygen should have eight. Where did this valence electron go to form this? It goes here. And now you have that. And that's the actual structure. There's both an ionic and covalent bond potassium hydroxide. Now, let's look at another situation, nitrogen gas. And here we have nitrogen has five valence electrons. If I had two nitrogens, each one has three single unpaired electrons. And this nitrogen says to that nitrogen, I bet you didn't know elements can talk. They can't, but I think they can. And it says, hey, I've got three unpaired electrons. You have three unpaired electrons. Let's pair them up. And there's one pair, two pair, three pair. And this is a triple bond. Because three pair of electrons, triple bond, two pair double bond, and one pair single bond. Now, if we look at each nitrogen, and if we look at this one, how many total electrons does it have, including shared? Two, four, six, eight. And the same for the other. So you now have an octet, and everybody's happy. And why don't you try this one? This is hydrogen cyanide, and I'll give you a hint. To make this work, the carbon has to be in the center. And it's your turn. And if we were face-to-face -face at COD, the first part of the lab, because it's really lab and discussion, I would be going through the problem set on the whiteboard, and you would be doing the same thing. I'd give you a chance to try it too, because Dr. White likes to share the fun. If I say fun enough time, you'll think it is, but it is. See how sneaky I am? I'm doing psychological warfare on you. Chemistry is fun. Chemistry is fun. Ooh. All right. I think, is everybody done? Let's do it. All right. Hydrogen has one valence electron. Carbon has four. Nitrogen has five. Hydrogen says Carbon, you have one, I have one, let's share. Now, that takes care of this one. Carbon says, I have three unpaired electrons. Nitrogen, you have three unpaired, let's share. And they do. And the non-bonding electrons on nitrogen are still there. And if we look at this, notice Hydrogen has its octet of two.
Carbon has its octet of shared and electrons of eight and its own. And finally, nitrogen has eight also. And that's how it works. Oh my goodness, I went over a minute into our break. Let's take a break, come back in five minutes. That would be uh, 9.57. Sorry about going over. I was just having so much fun with valence electrons and Lewis structure. I'll see you in five minutes. Dr. White's gonna stretch.
giving you all the symbols to, should we get started? Yes. <laughs> all right, everybody. Ring, 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 ring. <laughs> Time to start again. All right, quick thing I should mention this morning, I uploaded your lab scores for the last lab you handed in, not the one due today, but the last one. And that should be, uh, what is that? Lab number three. Today, you'll hand in sometime today or early tomorrow. I give you a little extra time. Uh, lab number four. We're doing lab number five. And the other thing I should have mentioned in class yesterday, but I'll tell you in tomorrow's lab too, uh, by Sunday morning, anybody who sent me an email asking about questions about their test, I'll have time by Sunday morning to check it and I'll answer you back via email. And if you still have a problem, we can always meet my office hour. And with that, Let's get back to work. All right, so we've been doing Lewis structures. Let's do one more. And nope, I don't want to use red. Why don't you draw the Lewis structure for potassium cyanide? Potassium has one valence electron, carbon four valence electrons, and nitrogen five valence electrons. And why don't you try that? And when you're done, if you don't have your camera on, webcam, give me a thumbs up or any other emoji you want to try. While you're working on that, I'm going to sneak out and look at what's happening in the real world. Do one more check of the real world.
All right, let's do this. Let me make sure yep, you've, all right. How do you draw the Lewis structure? All right, whenever you see an alkali metal, potassium is, it always forms a cation plus one. Carbon, four valence electrons. And nitrogen, five valence electrons. And carbon says, oh, look, nitrogen, you have three valence electrons, single. I have three, let's share. And they do. And you form a triple bond, the non-bonding. Now, carbon has one left, and you have potassium plus. But where did this valence electron? It went to carbon to form a polyatomic anion, and that's the structure. Now, notice in potassium cyanide, you have a triple bond. And that's how you do it. Let's go back to the problem set. And the last thing which we talked about, notice I say we, I talked about, and you were polite to listen, was hydrogen bonding. And any molecule that has a hydrogen on either oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine can hydrogen bond. And water will hydrogen bond. Ammonia can hydrogen bond. Turns out alcohols, and I'll show you the structure, has a hydrogen on an oxygen and also hydrogen fluoride, which is very nasty stuff, can hydrogen bond. And I talked about the wonders of hydrogen bonding, especially water. And with that, any questions on the problem set? Going once, going twice. Let's do the lab. Time for lab. And lab's going to be a lot of fun. How much fun? Well, let's find out. Hold on for the commercial. All right, everybody, do you see YouTube on your screen? Those of you who have, thank you. All right, time for Dr. White to have some fun. And why don't you watch? And hope you enjoyed the show. And what were you watching? Good question. What happens when you have fireworks and they give off all that light? Well, that's today's lab.
and thumbs up people. Oh, I forgot to change it. This should be, I use this for my other class too, chem, it should be chem, chem E 1211, but it's the same thing. And what's happening when you're doing fireworks? You're moving electrons from shell to shell. Now, you have your valence electrons. When you add energy, they go to a larger shell, a higher one. They go over here. Now, when they no longer have that energy to keep them there, they say, what am I doing over here? I should be back here. When they go back to their lower subshell and shell, they give off energy. And one way they give off energy is a certain color of light. Light is a form of energy. And the electrons are a specific distance. And then when they move, they give off energy. And that's the light you have. Now, one way to add energy is to heat up an element or a compound. And we're talking about mainly, almost exclusively, inorganic compounds. Now, in this lab, in part one, you'll find out what happens when you heat up different ionic compounds. Now, when we talk about an ionic compound, it's made up of, say, let's get my favorite one. Can you please pass the knuckle? And we talked about this in class. Sodium chloride has sodium plus anion, cations, and chloride minus anions. Now, how many of you have ever had water boil over when you're cooking rice or noodles? And what happens to your gas flame underneath? It goes from blue to yellow. Now, the question is, what's causing that? And you have two choices, the cation or the anion. And today's lab, we're gonna find out. Now, important lesson about doing research. Whenever you're doing a series of experiments, you should only change one variable at a time. And in this experiment, we're gonna do part one where all the cations are gonna be different, but the anion technically is the same even though it's maybe a little different and they'll be on lab Z, but essentially it's the same. The second part, we're gonna keep the cation the same and change the anion. And you'll be able to tell that the colors change for both. Does when you change the cation, it changes colors, but when you change the anion, it stays the same or vice versa. And you'll find out about that in today's lab. Now, the second part of the lab, if we were in the lab, we'd do this and it's not beyond lab Z, is how else can you see electrons moving from shell to shell? Here's an example of a product called glow in the dark paint. I don't know if you've ever played with that, it's a lot of fun. And unfortunately, uh, I can't do it in real life with you, but I made up some index cards where I put different stripes on there, different paint. And you can't tell the color when it's not glowing. And here's how you make it glow. One way of adding a lot of energy is using a UV light, a lamp. And we have those at COD. And I have students put the lamp over for a certain amount of time. And then how can we see it? Well, you can shut off the lights in a lab. So what Dr. White came up with was he created me a very expensive viewing observation device, otherwise known as a jewel paper shopping bag. And you put the card in there and look inside and you can see it glow. And there are three different colors. And based on the inorganic molecules in here that cause that glow by giving off, the electrons are going back down. Sometimes they all don't come down at the same rate. And you're asked to measure 
for salt on the th cards, which stripe is what color, and how long does it take to go dark? Now, some of them are very long, and I'm not going to have you sit there for two and a half, three hours. So I said, if it's greater than three minutes, put it greater than three. So let's look at the lab first, the written part, and then we'll go to beyond lab Z, and I'll show you how to do it. So this is called the flame test. In beyond lab Z, I'll show you in a second, you open it up, then uh, you put the test tube in uh, the ring stand. By the way, one of your colleagues, and I hate to admit it, she taught me so I shouldn't hate to admit it, but she should be, her mother should be proud. Taught me how to double click on test tube and get the test tube over quickly so you don't have to drag it like I was. Dot gen generation gap. By the way, the person who taught me was only or is only six years old. And I think tomorrow I'll become seven. So anyways, thank you, letter Z person. Anyways, what you'll do is take, and I'll show you in a second, put different samples of different chemicals, cations, into the Bunsen burner. And the Bunsen burner, you're burning gas to make a flame, which is heat, and that causes the electrons to go from shell to higher shell. And as soon as it moves up a little from the hottest part of the flame, it cools down again, and you see a uh, color. And in table one, these are the different ones. I have sodium chloride, and you use the Na plus and beyond lab Z. I have potassium chloride, copper chloride. That should be a lower case U. Sorry about that. and then barium chloride, ferric chloride, and strontium chloride. Now, in real life, and this is really cool, they didn't do it, and I'll talk to someone at Beyond Lab Z for next semester to fix it. When you use ferric chloride, not only do you see a color, but you see sparkles like in a sparkler. It's really cool, it's a lot of fun. But you don't see it in Beyond Lab Z, but in real life you would. So you're gonna do this and then put in the colors. And then let me go through the whole lab and then we'll go to beyond lab Z. In part B, you're gonna have the same cation but different anions. Unfortunately, beyond lab Z is not set up. If we are in a lab, this is the procedure how you do it. But I gave you the data. And this actually is what you see when you do it because I've taught this lab in the lab face-to-face -face many times. Now, the next part, which you can't do, well, you can do. Uh, students said, can we mix things? So I said, sure, have some fun. So here I have you uh, mix different chemicals and look at the colors. And here you have sodium chloride and strontium chloride, potassium chloride, strontium chloride, ferric chloride, and strontium chloride. You'll find out when you use strontium chloride why it's one of my favorites, but I won't give it away. And then I tell the students, try your favorite pair and put down the color. And remember with ferric chloride, anytime you use it, you'd also see sparkles in there. Now, to make this an interesting lab, here are some unknowns. If you were in a lab, I'd have a bottle label unknown A and unknown B. See how creative Dr. White can be? And since you can't, they don't have it set up this way in Beyond Lab Z, unknown A is this color, unknown B is this color. And the questions later on, you have to identify what's A and B from your observations in table one. See how sneaky I can be? Well, it's fun. Now, talked about glow in the dark and how does it move? Well, the electrons are moving and that's how you see the light, what you call glow in the dark. Now here, if we had, I have different cards 
And there are three stripes on each one labeled A, B, and C for the cards, uh, three areas. And you hold it under the UV light, put it in the viewing brown paper bag and measure them out. Now, if we were there, I have 20 different cards and they're arranged differently, A, B, and C. But for today, don't worry about the card number. And if you did, you would have seen A is a red color, glow in the dark paint, this is how long it lasts, B is blue, and C is green. And here are the questions. So remember, this lab, you're moving electrons from shell to shell. And the fireworks you saw earlier.